Welcome back. This will be the third episode. I'm going to record um, the second chapter today, which is called When Less of the... Oh, wait a second. The second chapter is actually called How the Wicked World Was Made. And there's my bookmark. Oh, no. Isn't even there where I need it. Um, how the Wicked World Was Made. Last time you saw this already... Um, in most of the chapters, I included uh, little excerpts, one sentences or a couple of um, bullet points. This time it's modern world favors abstract thinking, but doesn't teach the tools well. It kind of rings a bell, but not really. This chapter is going to be, how long is it? Uh, almost 20 pages. And flipping through it, there's scars, markings. One, two, three, four. Smiley face. Probably a joke. Nothing, nothing of importance. Six. Hmm. Well, okay. I'm going to get started, but first let me address... Um, uh, some things that we've discovered last time, which was basically um, that the actual process is easier or was easier last time. Going to see how it's um, how it's gonna roll today. Um, but last time was easier already because I <laughs> is it really because I don't know. That's that's a story I tell myself. I think about this book and its contents um, from time to time between the recordings, which is. No, once a week. Um, yeah, and it seems the um, the effort of processing the book already has this one weird effect, at least, that I'm thinking about um, range, excellence, learning, a bit in my spare time. It's it's a thing um, that is that is sufficiently important to bother me, if you will. Um, yeah. I guess it's just, it's it's mostly because I spend time doing this. So uh, yeah, maybe maybe I will actually remember the contents of this book years from now when I'm finished with this um, with this not so dense but still a rather long book. Yeah, let's embark on the journey. Continue forward. I think I'm going to finish uh, chapter two today uh, and don't need two sessions, but we'll see how things go. I have no clue um, what kind of references I need to pick up and research, um, wh what kind of material is needed. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the visualization of the network that is building up that I'm going to include at the end. Um, I've teased about this in the forums um, with, a, with a little script I wrote uh, last week. So maybe... Yeah, maybe this turns out to be useful as well. We'll see. So, let's get on with it. See you on the other side. All right, let's get started. This is the note that we're going to work with. As always, this is structure note. But this time, let me narrow down my Emacs. Oh, that was the wrong shortcut. Let me down my narrow down my Emacs outline um, to focus on the Zettelkasten demo that we're doing here. So you see that I'm keeping a log of to do's and notes as we work. All right, so, and you see there's the metadata for the video as well. But this chapter is blank spanking new. There's nothing for me to do yet, but I found this in the last chapter's uh, ultimate chapter, uh, not chapter, ultimate um, paragraph. And I like this quote. I wanted to keep it. Don't know why I didn't do it last time. It's pretending the world is like gold and chess is comforting. It makes for a tidy, kind world message and some very compelling books. But it's not accurate to model your reality after this, is what I have to say about this. It's a... Yeah. It's a nice summary. I wanted to keep it. And I think I missed out on this um, last time because I was just uh, too tired to continue and was a bit um, yeah, scatterbrained. Here I'm getting an overview again of all the things that are going on. And the framework for today, which I will lay out, lay out in advance based on some notes and the summary from the um, chapter intro is, is this. These are the things that seem to interest me. Um, 
the concepts and terms that I wanted to keep from this chapter. Being the lazy person that I am, I started with what I thought would be the easiest term, eduction. It popped out in one place and I found it had a nice ring to it, so I wanted to find out more about it. And there I did find the source in the notes and then began searching for the citation, which turned out to be kind of a dead end. It's a whole book on some statistic stuff regarding psychology. That's not my forte at all. But nevertheless, I managed to add the citation to my reference manager, uh, which you see here, because thankfully the, I think it was the Cambridge uh, something, th something um, provided a BibTeX export. And this is the final citation for the chapter that I thought would be the most, um, yeah, the, the closest to the topic. Uh, all the others had a, had a different um, appeal to them. And here I also added the book um, as a parent reference and cross cite them again, as you have seen in the last uh, episode of this series. So naturally, I wanted to get to the full text reference for the, uh, the full text for the references and uh, look them up to get the reference for the Spearman text that Flynn, the author of this article, is talking about. But, but lo and behold, there's no, no reference. It's, it's not cited. Time for a cup of tea to calm my nerves. Because, well, what, what kind of science is this? You know, what, what madness. Hmm. Next best thing is to look up the term eduction, I figured. Because, you know, what else could go wrong? But here you are, edux, and it's, yeah, here's the long story short. Uh, it's a kind of esoteric self-help development term, which doesn't help at all with the thing that I'm setting myself up to, which is um, processing David Epstein's book called Range and getting the term eduction used by spearmen and companions. But I've, since I found this and uh, didn't find the premise of this the self-help concept um, disgusting. I thought, well, let's take note of this. I mean, it's my settle custom. Why not have garbage in it when I can? The result of my research on eduction, of course, made its way back into the concept note about eduction, the term, which is going to be an overview of all the different kinds of eductions that are there out in the wild. But still no sign of spearmen, so I went to Wikipedia to get some trace and look up the actual um, word origin because I'm, uh, I'm not versed in Latin, so this helps. And there you go, the first break. 45 minutes have already passed. This is going to be a long one. So I'm going to prepare for the next stretch of work. And here I continue with my quest to find out what eduction is and where it comes from. And it's not a very scientific quest. This quest led me to Wikipedia, after all, and some web sources, because I don't have the full text handy, and Flynn it himself didn't seem to be that helpful, after all. So I decide to ditch everything he says, and I'm slowing this down a bit, and I moved the chapter um, of his book from my reference manager. It was so utterly useless for my goals that I just figured, well, why, why don't I just throw it away, just keep the book as a reference there, remove all the clutter, and then, uh, well, at least know that this Flynn guy told about this topic at some point in time, and be content with what I get. Researching some more of the context about the uh, term's origin, this is the final note um, on deduction. It led me to the um, general IQ G-factor analysis, which I haven't heard before at all. And some of you who study um, psychology may be, may be well more versed in this term. I'm adding this back to the Epstein note and then also at the obligatory reference to the Raven, what's it called? Raven's progressive matrices. Um, which are the actual part of uh, the psychology or IQ tests, sorry, um, that are meant to test for the eduction capability. Um, 
Eduction, after all, seems to be a t fancy term used to um, describe observable um, inference capabilities. Like you get some uh, some items and then figure out what the sequence might be for yourself. And here's the also obligatory note on Raven's progressive matrices because it seems to be so common and useful uh, in, in psychology and IQ tests in general that I thought, well, might as well extract this into a, its, its own note. Here I'm weaving things together, all of them, very slowly because there's not so much going on in the notes that I thought, found. But what's the story here? Is the pre-modern world the kind world and the modern world the wicked? That's the actual question that this uh, chapter is posing. If you remember, um, kind learning environments are very controlled and wicked are always changing. Uh, I, I can come up with the uh, author from the top of my head, but it's called Martian Tennis, the wicked world, where the rules change as you play. I found this um, metaphor to be quite useful. And here you see me fiddling around with the uh, structure note, trying to figure out what I really need and what I really want to find out. It's a puzzle this time. And there it is, emboldened. I need to find the connection between abstract thinking and surviving in a wicked world to make the parts that comprise this chapter to really click. Which is not easy because, you know, it's still this book by Epstein with uh, the very hand wavy uh, approach to everything. And it did lead Epstein to the term computational thinking at the very end of the chapter, which I wanted to extract as well. Again, with the create the link in advance, then click on it, then create the note after you reach the dead end method. Ah, there must be a shorter name. It's, it's so common in, in uh, wikis nowadays and historically too. So this uh, this was very useless to point out. No. And no, I'm finding, I was finding the uh, text that uh, Epstein was referencing and figuring out what the computational thinking stuff would be. This is more in my alley of things like computing and uh, computer science, programming and uh, another break. And this time you see, I cannot let go and have to um, finish a thought and, and an idea I found very interesting um, and wanted to keep just just a glimpse of it before I leave for the break any second now and here it comes the break there it is kind of refreshed but not really I notice um, that the the camera colors of when I open the book it changes and when I close it it changes to uh, again to a weird color. So uh, please bear with me if this happens. I hope it's not too distracting. So yeah, what was I? Uh, computational thinking. Um, it's an interesting topic to me because uh, programming is so, so integral to what I do. Um, especially terms like separation of concerns. It's a technical term used in computing all the t uh, programming all the time, especially um, object-oriented programming, if that rings a bell. And of course, I have a note on this um, for example, to, to add to my books. And so I'm adding references here and there um, to, to link computational thinking and separation of concerns, which is all about modular, uh, what that's a term, modularizing uh, the things that you do so you can make sense of the parts, for example. And I decided to um, point the link from separation of concerns to computational thinking instead of the other way around. And with a day or two um, of, of uh, not having worked on this, I, I wonder why I did that. I mean, w wouldn't it make sense to link to the more general thing instead of the more specific? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure at all. And uh, in the meantime, I noticed the bug in um, the archive which is related to uh, tab titles. So here you see me as a short interlude invoking the um, shortcut to add a to-do list item from anywhere. And there I file it in my thearchive.org file. So I can work on the archive and make it even better with the next update, fixing the very minuscule bug that I just took note of. Yeah, 
here I'm quoting the author Janet Wing some more about computational thinking and it's taken me surprisingly long. But this part at the top, it didn't fit. I, I, I wrote it down first, I think, but it just doesn't fit the computational thinking topic in general. So I extract it because yeah, I want to keep it, but it doesn't belong there. And I remember um, the, the quip that naming things in programming is hard, one of the hardest things. And I found some source, but not. it's not in a book, it's just a saying, you know? So how do you quote a saying? I decided to go with uh, Martin Fowler, who's a very well-known um, author in programming space. And I think he's a very reliable source. So let's keep him instead of some some any other author that I found on the web. That's the final quip note. I put the links there. And there's the other note that I prepared first or before beforehand. Um, that is not about naming things is hard in general, but about the part um, why giving some things different names could be a problem. And it turns out I uh, mostly add commentary um, here. It's not it's not the quote per se. Um, it's more like the associations that I have with this that I want to keep and end up keeping. I hope this is making sense to you all. But with the burden of the quote uh, removed from the original note on computational thinking, I was able to um, refactor the existing note and um, compress it some more. So I get uh, this nice overview list of things that I think are important to Janet Wing in her article. So up next, of course, is the integration into the range structure node, which is surprisingly short for all the work that we've done so far, isn't it? And with all the information that I've gathered, I figured that the chapters one and two, um, the last episode and this episode, uh, interweave somehow already and that I would very much like to connect the parts but I'm not sure how yet because there are some pieces missing. The automation thing um, from Whitehead and stuff um, sounded, sounded useful here again but well there was not much I could do now so I decided to focus on another thing which is the lack of real arguments in this chapter and nail this down before the time runs up. So, so this isn't a lot, and I wonder if I'm missing crucial parts. If I'm too, you know, too stupid to really grasp what's going on. I also looked for the um, problem that people don't seem to be able to transfer domain knowledge across domain boundaries. But apparently, I haven't processed this and take note of this before. And so I'm content with the reference to Epstein and instead focus on the next topic, which is education and university studies and how they don't teach the skills that are required to tackle the modern life very well, which is ultimately a segue into the question, what is modern and pre-modern in Epstein's terms? And it's just industrialized versus not industrialized. Um, I can work with that. And now here I'm refactoring the uh, note and removing the uh, eduction part at the bottom in favor of a short link that is hidden and obstructed by the um, work break timer. And then to finish off this uh, episode that took me about three hours now uh, to record, I think, um, I'm extracting the Fermi problems as a to-do into my task management. Oh, well then, I figured after the break that I should summarize all of this to get a better grasp on things because it's taking too long already and the summarization that I began to create was uh, stuck in this state. I didn't notice until right now that I never finished the second um, list items a sentence. Weird. So instead I found that um, David Epstein supports his argument by huh, what's this? begging the question. He says, but it's certainly true that modern life requires range, making connections across far-flung domains and ideas. Well, duh, that's the point you want to make, not the thing that you have to tell me over and over again. Where's the arguments, Mr. Epstein? Where? Oh, and so I'm expanding this section at the bottom um, with the things that are supported, in fact, by this chapter, the 
things that are not supported by this chapter which leave me puzzled are still unfinished and that's a common thing when I process this book I find. I didn't find another source so I'm taking note of it in my um, task management system again and there you go that's the last task and that's all I have to tell you about the second episode ah, third episode sorry <laughs> yeah, well okay here's the final note I'm gently scrolling through it and you see the list is quite long this time but there's still trouble that needs to be resolved maybe next episode maybe Maybe never, maybe later. What I want to show you now at the end is um, a little little thing that I came up with, which is a script to visualize node clusters. And I'm not reading the script itself to you here, but instead showing you the results, which is here in the center, you see the structure node um, range by David Epstein and around it the first and then the second and third layer links that uh, pertain this little cluster of topics. It's all not very deeply nested, but let's compare it to last time. And here you see the web is expanding. I like the gestalt of all of this. And let's see where this is going and if we can extract useful information from all of this. Well, and that's it already. That was the third episode. And I hope you enjoyed what you saw. It was a very compressed episode because I took so much longer this time to record all of the things that were going on. It was an interesting chapter, but not very, hmm, let's say, I'm, I'm, I'm not very satisfied with the result pertaining Mr. Epstein it, himself and his work. But well, there you go. Please leave comments in the forums. Tell us about the format and what you like to see and what you missed and things that you didn't understand because I was too fast or whatever. Thank you for watching this time and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.